guess I'll just give a little bit of motivation here. Um, this is uh, not yet talking specifically about the chip yet, but just sort of some of the philosophy maybe behind you know why we uh, architected Loihi in the way we did, why it looks like it does. Um, you know, so we we started this program at Intel uh, a little over four years ago, uh, and for the most part, nobody in the program had any prior experience with uh, neuromorphic computing, neuroscience, anything like that. So you know, we. Uh, uh, my team specifically had been doing Ethernet switches of all things, so pretty about as far as you can get to, uh, you know, neural chips. You you may think, um, so you know, we at Intel naturally you may think we we approach this from a very much an engineering perspective, and engineers like specs and you know gathering customer data, you know, informing the the definition of the architecture. So you know, we could look at nature, see, see the fantastic uh, you know, 20 watt brain out there and, um, and, and perhaps take a biomimicry approach, right? So read a bunch of neuroscience papers, uh, construct a big laundry list of features and um, you know, there's our engineering architectural spec that we can then go and then implement. Um, and um, you know, um, unfortunately it's not that simple, right? Because you know, we're in a, a really different design regime compared to nature. Um, we have just different tools, semiconductor CMOS transistors, uh, as opposed to you know ion channels and membranes and lipids and all this uh, that that nature is using, and uh, you know for the most part today um, it, you know we're at a disadvantage. Um, say if we want to reach the scale of the human brain, so we're uh, if you, if you take the neocortex and make a planar projection of that and look at the density that uh, you know you you achieve in in neurons and synapses compared to say the state of the art neuromorphic implementations that have kind of as a, the equivalent as possible feature set, um, you can compare those. You know, we have planar technology. The neocortex can be looked at as a planar uh, system. And we're maybe about 20 times off in terms of neuron density and what we can do. 400 times off in, uh, in synaptic density. Um, and then in synaptic op energy, you know, sort of the energy per primitive operation, uh, if you want to count it as synapses, you know, we're even further off, or maybe thousands, you know, times off. So we're at a pretty significant disadvantage. Um, I think uh, from from what we've seen so far, the area density disadvantages are are, are more the troubling ones. That that's the that's the critical. Uh, constraint there because that limits what we're able to uh, achieve, right? What, what the types of problems we can run. And as you saw on my Wednesday presentation, uh, as, as you scale up, you know, that's when we start to see really, really compelling gains for this type of a fine-grained parallel architecture. So we need to get to scale, um, and, and we're at a significant disadvantage there. Um, the, the energy differential is even bigger, but on the other hand, we are so far off uh, compared to nature, you know, in terms of if you look at everything a brain is doing compared to what we can even conceive of approaching with with chips today, um, that I, I I don't actually regard that 2000x as the, uh, you know, the the more critical issue. It's more the density that we have to offset. So luckily we have some advantages. So you can see, uh, you know, I've, I've listed the maximum firing rate in nature. As you all know, neurons are fi firing at really slow speeds compared to what we're used to in computing. Millisecond timescales, you know, a period of about 10 milliseconds is about as fast as a neuron will spike uh, compared to gigahertz frequencies, right? A nanosecond, uh, uh, you know, periodicity in our activity is, is really not hard at all uh, with modern CMOS circuits. So that's a, that's a really good advantage we have. And in particular, we can trade off then um, multiplexing for offsetting this area of disadvantage. So if you multiplex, use like best known methods of design today, pipelining and multiplexing, um, you can reuse the same circuit many, many times and effectively shrink down the area by that multiplexing factor. So, so immediately we recognize that there's some differences that we can take uh, in order to you know, achieve the same functionality but adjusting for the different design regime that we're in. Uh, we can also design reliable circuits. So nature can achieve reliable operation. I mean, you know, mostly, you know, we roll out of bed every morning and we don't fall over. I mean, it's, you know, animals can be quite reliable, but they achieve that um, through 
a certain amount of redundancy, right? So the more reliable an operation, you, you need to spend more neural resources to achieve that. So that's another advantage we potentially have. We don't want to necessarily give that up. And in particular, that leads us to want to stick, among other reasons, to a digital design paradigm in our program, uh, at least uh, for the time being, because that means you know, we can get fully deterministic, reliable operation. And that's a, that's a key advantage we don't want to give up too quickly. Um, there's a bunch of other differences, so these are maybe not all as appreciated you know, on, on everyone's mind, but you know, for example, a really important one is being able to reprogram the system. Right? So we don't want to just wait 20 years for our chip to get fully programmed until we can then use it. Um, we want to be able to, on a really fast timescale, reprogram it to solve one problem after the next after the next. Um, that's actually a hard feature, right? Nature hasn't figured that one out, right? So, um, so in some sense, we're overachieving compared to nature. And so for that reason, all told, the systems that we build actually, although we would regard them as neuromorphic, meaning that we're absolutely directly inspired by the form of you know, what we see this, nature's solutions to the computational problems we're interested in, we're trying to emulate that. We're, we're approaching it and we find a different specific solution to that. Um, the, the key point is that the objectives are the same for nature and for our artificial systems. Um, you know, we want very good energy efficiency. We want very fast response times. You know, that's critical for survival and that's critical for solving problems quickly. Um, and we want cheap manufacturing. So broadly speaking, the objectives, the drivers of evolution over 600 million years of brain evolution um, should be completely applicable to the systems that we want to build. And the answers that nature has discovered over that period of time should be um, applicable in some way to the systems we build. So that means that we have to understand the principles that arise, you know, has arisen over that period of you know, millions of years, um, and understand them and adapt them into the system that we're building. So that, that's our philosophy. That's the perspective that we brought into uh, the Loihi, uh, you know, our uh, neuromorphic research program. And uh, that's uh, good to keep in mind. Now, this question of spikes comes up, and uh, it, it, you know, I think you know, are spikes efficient or not? Um, I, I, there's a, a ton of confusion around this, and uh, just you know, maybe not necessarily thinking from the right perspective. And so here's a slide I'll walk through that is really just providing a completely different intuitive perspective, I think, on, on spikes and the neuromorphic architectures that arise to support uh, spike-based communication. Um, and, and largely, you know, you'll see this is uh, exploiting sparsity. So, you know, that's one thing we see in brains is that, you know, there, there's sparse activity in space and in time, and that's critical for the, for the efficiency. And, it, you know, we, we can argue intuitively all day long. I think we're accumulating the evidence to show that actually, you know, an artificial neuromorphic system is now providing that in a really rigorously benchmarked way. But this, let me just, you know, convey some of an intuitive view on maybe changes your perspective on what this architecture is all about. Uh, so in nature, you know, this is an axon and a spike, and, and this is a digital signal. It's sparse in time, right, in the sense that, um, you know, this, this spike is just moving along at a relatively so, slow speed uh, along this axon. Um, you know, it's normally off. It's preferring the zero state, and then there's just a, a ripple of one bit, you know, no other information other than the fact that it spikes, you know, along that wire. Now, uh, when we go and implement that, um, it doesn't look like that, right? We have time multiplexing. We have these router mesh 2D mesh routing infrastructure that's um, that, that, that's sending all these time multiplexed spike messages around. You know, we're forced to represent these spikes as kind of a you know a packetized message of some kind, right? Um, so, and then that 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 message is moving through this router interconnect. It's taking you know 16 wires in the case in in, in Loihi, 32-bit uh, message. And, uh, and it's going through these, you know, relatively large, you know, router circuits, um, you know, compared to, you know, the biological model, which is just this thin wire here, right? So some may look at this and, and instinctively say that, ah, well, you know, this is, uh, this is not, how can this be efficient? You know, you're so far off of what nature is doing. But on the other hand, recognize that in today's process technology, um, you know, the average diameter of a myelinated axon is one micron. And we can fit 16 wires no problem in one micron. So you know, your sense of scale is perhaps you know, not, not what you think. Um, and then furthermore, because of the time multiplexing, you know, yes, this router structure is relatively large. It's actually not that big, actually. But we're, we're multiplexing this at a factor of like 1,000 or more, I mean, compared to biology. So it's shrinking the effective area of that router down to practically nothing. 
So half of the brain area is white matter, right, which is the routing interconnect. And, and actually, we're doing you know, roughly similar to that, probably even a little less uh, in low EHE uh, in terms of the, not, not even the routing infrastructure, but more the tables that are associated with uh, mapping the connectivity. That's really more the area uh, driver in the chip. But this routing infrastructure area-wise is, is uh, not at all you know, dissimilar to a, to a you know, network of axon wiring. Um, and so then when you step up and you, back and you look at the whole mesh of the neuromorphic system, um, you know, what's important is that you know, the, the macroscopic activity that you get, what's important is the groups of neurons that are active and, and when they're active, right? So you just get this kind of ripple of, of communicating sets of neurons, and it's just sparse, and it's just a kind of a trickle of activity based on when there's uh, important computation to be done. Um, you know, now, now you compare that to the von Neumann processor architecture, which is basically a variant of that is also GPUs and, uh, uh, you know, this is all following pretty much the same general structure here from a system architecture perspective. You have these memory hierarchy and you have these computing elements, the logic, highly multiplexed, highly flexible circuits, but you have just these kind of cyclic operations. You know, it's just this kind of continual stream of reading a stream of instructions, decoding it, reading the data, changing it, writing it back to register files and caches, then your second cache, then your third cache, and then your DRAM, and then your non-volatile memory. You know, but there's all these like cycles of memory that are axes, and it's, it's just very different from what you get in an architecture, a neuromorphic architecture, a, a brain-inspired architecture. So that's not to say one or the other is you know, more efficient or less. It's just it's very different, right? And so we should expect there to be different types of problems that one solves better than the other. And it's not you know, one being necessarily more efficient or, uh, than another. Um, and, and just from to, to th look at this again from a completely different perspective, you know, what is important in a neuromorphic architecture? You know, if you really look at the computation that's happening, more than anything else, it's these little white boxes, which is not what we tend to focus on, but the white boxes are, are table lookups. You know, once you're in this multiplex digital environment, um, in fact, all the analog chips have these as well, these white boxes, and that's dominating the information transfer in the system. Um, this, is, this is routing, right? This is determining, okay, I have this event, now who do I communicate it to? And then, and that's happening again and again and again. So you get this transmission and routing distribution of these events, and the synaptic operation accumulating weights and uh, you know, decaying membrane potential and that sort of thing is relatively a small piece of, of what's happening here. And yet, you know, we, we tend to focus a, a lot on that. Of course, mathematically for the computational model, they matter a lot. But if you just look at what the chip is doing, it's much more just determining where and when to send, uh, send these events. And again, compare that to a conventional model. Well, you know, you have just this one fixed function, you know, I mean, generalizing and simplifying a little bit, right? But so much of this activity is about how to very intelligently and cleverly reuse a flexible single computing element, you know, an ALU or a multiplier, and just doing instruction decoding and dispatching, and sequencing, and resolving data dependencies. But it's in this kind of single kind of table iteration through this memory with a computing element, and you get this, you know memory bottleneck and all that good stuff that we all know about. So, so this is just to show that it's, these are just a very different architecture overall when you look at this. And um, you know, we're, we're exploring this realm to find out you know, what is it good for. You know, it, it's clearly going to be good for things that are different from <coughs> conventional computing. And our hope is that it's actually a nice broad space of really interesting computation similar to what you know, the brain, its adoption of that kind of an uh, architecture can do. OK, so now onto the chip. That's done with philosophy. Uh, we're we're going to talk about bits and uh, wires and all that good stuff. Um, so this is what the chip looks like in, under the covers. Um, you know, pretty boring, really, because it's, it's just mainly just this neuromorphic mesh. So we have this uh, single core. Uh, each of the cores implements up to 1,024 neurons. Um, and that's, again, in this time multiplexed way. So we have a, a collection of memories inside it, which collectively represent all the state and the configuration for those, those neurons. Um, we group the, the cores into, uh, we, we gang them together, you can see, into kind of this unit of what we call a tile. So that's uh, four cores with kind of rotational symmetry so that we can create like a nice symmetric unit. Um, and, and then we just extend this tile out. 
It's all done in an asynchronous design methodology, which means that the tile is, is a completely closed contained unit. Um, we don't have any clock to be distributed across this at all. So we can create as big or as small a chip as we like, just literally by changing the parameters in array function in our layout tool, just to create a big chip or a small chip. Um, nothing to be verified further beyond that for that whole neuromorphic mesh. And it was just local uh, asynchronous communication across this 2D mesh. Uh, dimension order routed uh, spike messages going from you know core to core. Um, so beyond that, we have uh, you know you can see these off chip interfaces. So four in each planar direction. We have these parallel I/O uh, off chip interfaces. These these are asynchronous. You know you, you've probably heard about this AER for address event representation. It's kind of a similar protocol there, but it's a packetized message uh, based. Now what happens is that the spike messages are all you know, sent locally inside the chip, if they need to go off chip, there's a, there's a multi-chip router unit which encapsulates the spikes uh, with an off chip header, which then allows us to address across up to 16,000 chips, um, you know, uh, just again by tiling the chips together without any additional circuitry. Uh, but that, that's basically, and, and the, the I.O., the off-chip I.O. interfaces are also conveying management, you know, just general read and write operations just so that you can go ahead and, you know, all of the architectural state and all of this mesh and all of these cores is visible to this protocol. So that means you can have your host CPU that we talked about in the ARM, uh, the, the FPGA off-chip, and it can just issue reads and writes like it would for any, you know, I.O. map device, uh, memory mapped I.O. device, and, uh, and, and go ahead and configure the chip monitor what's going on uh, and uh, just you know perform the computation feed it data in and out um, now you know off chip communication is expensive so we don't always want to be driving this from some off chip CPU um, we found you know there's there's a critical need for von Neumann CPUs and you know they're not going away anytime soon so in fact we've integrated three of these you know deeply you know right next to the mesh here and that's so that we can have very tight you know, uh, communication loops with the uh, neuromorphic cores. Um, at, at minimum, this is useful for data encoding into spikes, right? So sending spikes off chip is actually not necessarily the most efficient thing to do. If you, you know, if you're expanding some conventional data stream into spikes, you, you, you know, that may be a relatively high bandwidth operation, and it could be much better to do that, you know, inside the chip where you have, you know, much higher bandwidths available in, in this internal mesh. So, so that's, that's the default function that these uh, integrated uh, x86 processors uh, that we call Lakemont processors. You can see they're LMT. You may hear us refer to them as, as Lakemonts later. Um, so they're, they're very simple processors. I mean, they literally have like 64 kilobytes of data RAM uh, in each one. So these are really just embedded simple processors. You're not going to boot Linux or anything on these. The, the Linux runs elsewhere. Uh, this is bare metal programming uh, for, for you know, tight interaction. Yeah, question? Within the core, uh, they, they interact just like they do between the cores. Uh, so we'll, we'll get into that. So we're going to dive deeper, right? So uh, we'll talk about that. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that's um, pretty much all to, to mention here. Um, OK, so looking in the core, um, this is uh, uh, sort of architecturally, this is what a neuron core looks like. Uh, all these boxes are basically individual SRAMs. So inside the core, you know, the take home here is that, well, it's not, it's definitely not a von Neumann architecture inside the core, right? It's not that we have a memory and then some logic block, which is just accessing all the state and all that. Um, you know, what we have is a optimized pipeline uh, that, that performs all the neural computation in a high performance, you know, pipeline manner. And we have a couple different sort of independent asynchronous loops or, or, or processes that interlock and communicate as necessary, but are otherwise quite decoupled. So the, the green is kind of illustrating the pathway of spike handling as the spikes arrive into the core. Um, this kind of purple is showing the updating of neuron state, um, which is responding to the spike input, but you know, in a decoupled way, uh, as, as those uh, neuron models are generating spikes, well then it invokes this output kind of blue process which is then directing the spikes and addressing them out to the knock. And then we have this kind of loop of red which is the plasticity, you know, where we're periodically up kind of monitoring and inspecting all the uh, activity that's accumulated in the, in the cores and in the neurons and synapses and then applying changes to the, to the weights and the synaptic parameters. So that's kind of just generally the flow. We're actually going to 
won't go too much deeper uh, in the design, uh, but uh, um, but instead I'll, I'll walk through some of the features. So you know, hopefully you have some background awareness. Uh, yeah, question. What are all those titles there? I'm just like, I can't read them. So. Yeah, they're just they're just letters. Yeah, they're just letters. Just letters. Yeah, letters. <laughs> Um, so, so we implement a uh, discrete time leaky integrate and fire uh, neuron model, um, specifically Kuba, if you're uh, familiar with that. So we have a um, current response to every spike. So that's a, um, typically an exponentially decaying you know, postsynaptic current. And then that gets integrated in a leaky manner uh, to a voltage value. So that's just the basic kind of, uh, I mean, it's possible to go simpler in terms of a leaky integrating fire. You can get rid of that current response and just treat each spike as an impulse. But we found plenty of algorithmic need for this somewhat more complicated leaky integrating fire neuron model, Kuba. We didn't go as far as COBA. So COBA is a conductance-based uh, uh, model, which introduces some extra nonlinearities. We don't have like Isakevich neurons. We don't have you know, extra synaptic variables. Um, so we found that this is just the sweet spot. You know, we, we try to make it as simple as possible, but you know, no simpler, uh, and and this is what we came up with. Um, now, you know, maybe a case could be made that you know maybe we do need a bit more complexity, uh, but uh, but in any case, uh, this this seems to service a, a broad enough need, and we found interesting ways to uh, you know, to, to adapt this too. I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. Um, for example, we support multi-compartment dendritic trees. Uh, so, you know, this is something we, we did not necessarily just to try to support, you know, pyramidal cells and apical and distal dendrites and all this, but um, mainly I'll, I'll share a little bit later about how this gets implemented, but mainly we did this because it actually ended up being really, really simple. So surprisingly easy to integrate into the architecture. And um, you know, it's interesting to think that, well, well, maybe there's some parallels here about why you know, real neurons have dendrites and do graded, continuous valued computation through the dendrites uh, to, and then spike at the soma. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it, that's the domain, the extent over which you can do efficient analog computing. Um, effectively, that's what perhaps we found here. And so there, there's a certain domain within the core that we can very efficiently do kind of continuous graded computation, aggregate this up in a tree structure. Um, and so therefore, you know, we did it. Uh, the one real practical reason we need this um, that we found, um, and we've found others since then, but at, uh, during architecting the chip, is, is actually just the simplest possible join operation as you aggregate this tree of, of, of addition, right? So if we want to add different compartments that have different exponential time responses to each synapse, which you commonly have. You may have an inhibitory response that is a, a longer time constant of, of current integration than an excitatory uh, spike. Uh, rather than have to make a more complicated neuron model to explicitly have this on, on, on every neuron, we just treat that as two different compartments, which you can just add the currents together. So kind of a more general um, and simpler architecture can allow us to uh, address these, you know, less common but still important use cases where you where you want to have this more diverse, complex neuron type. So that's not normally what a neuroscience would uh, scientist would think about as far as compartments. But once we went that far, it was very easy to add a couple other, you know, possibilities for how you join and build this dendritic tree, and then maybe you'll find some good use for it. As some teams have. There's a question. The handshakes are everywhere. So we don't show the handshakes in our asynchronous design paradigm here. Uh, handshakes are just, you know, they're, they're on every little pipeline stage, every SRAM. Handshakes are just automatic. We, we think of, in our design methodology, we think of tokens of data, right? And, uh, the, and th those tokens are just atomic units, and they're being passed around. And, you know, when two processes, like, you know, when the input spike process here has to coordinate, you know, with this uh, neuron update process, well, then they're going to handshake, and it'll stop and synchronize, right? But otherwise, they're decoupled, and they're operating you know, as, as, as fast as they can. So and then, pretty much all the handshakes are local-based in some manner. It's not oh, like yeah. Yeah, local, completely local. Yeah, it's just you know, stage to stage uh, handshaking. Yeah. Yeah, it's a digital signal processing system is well, you know, one way to think about it, right? So yeah, you have to service state, update it dynamically, you know, according to this discrete time neuron model. <laughs>
Okay, so then we also have homeostasis, so a simple mechanism to adapt in the, the threshold over time uh, in response to the activity of the neuron. So that's a you know, particular feature inspired uh, from the neuroscience, of course. Um, We've found, uh, you, you've heard about maybe the LSNN model. I think I, I, I briefly mentioned it on Wednesday. Uh, this uh, uh, simple adaptive neuron model that Wolfgang Moss's team at Graz has found uh, can, can implement LSTM-like functionality. Um, that requires a, a sort of adaptive threshold mechanism. Unfortunately, it's not exactly the one we implemented, but nevertheless, we found a way to, to work it into the architecture. So, so modifying the, the threshold over time is, is something that uh, definitely algorithm researchers are finding a use for, and, um, and, and we support that. Uh, we support random noise sources. So, you know, as you've seen in a variety of contexts, uh, you know, noise in these neural systems are, you know, not always a bug at all. You know, they're, they're as much a feature as, as, a, as a limitation. And so, um, you know, we insert noise, pseudo-random noise. Uh, again, we preserve determinism in the operation. That's really good for uh, software development, algorithm development. Um, and uh, random noise sources are really cheap, right? Uh, so they're, they're, it's not a difficult feature at all. So, so we have that. You can add that on the membrane potential. You can add that to currents. Um, you can even add that in the refractory period. So, so that's something else we have is a axon delay. So you can add delay to the, uh, when you generate a spike. And then also the neuron will go into a refractory period. You can add a random number on that refractory period too, which is an efficient place to introduce some stochasticity into the system. Then we have our output routing tables here. So this is as the neuron spike, you have to determine, okay, where does the spike go? And so that's a series of table lookups. And you see here, there's a, a general principle that we apply throughout the design, um, which is we, we don't, as much as possible, we, we try to share the resources that are available as opposed to creating very rigid constraints per neuron. So for example, we don't have a crossbar architecture at all in any of our connectivity. Uh, I think every prior neuromorphic system uses crossbar connectivity architecture, which is hugely limiting. Um, you know, you, you may have to, un, and under the covers, you know, deep under the hood, uh, it may be a crossbar. An SRAM is basically a crossbar. Uh, but you, know, you, you need to use it, we found, to, to support a broad possible uh, diversity of network topologies. You have to get away from this rigid crossbar uh, constraint. So, uh, we don't at all think in terms of crossbars. We think in terms of table, routing tables, which can be compressed and encoded in very clever ways to, to really uh, get the maximum efficiency of this precious memory resource in the chip. And so that's what you're seeing in the, in the output stage. You know, we have kind of a pointer to list type of architecture. So any neuron can communicate to, in theory, you know, as many other cores in the system as it needs to. Um, subject to just the constraint that all lists of communication should add up and fit within the fixed resource SRAM, you know, memory size that, that we have available. And that also is applying on the input side. So as spikes are coming in, we have a pooled synaptic memory. So similarly, it's not just a rigid crossbar that, that says, okay, you get, you know, some number of output connections and that's it, right? You, you can have more or, or less depending on the network need and it just all has to add up to this 128 kilobyte number, you know, in, in a given core. Now, you know, I mentioned we have all these clever kind of compression schemes and we have uh, basically four different compression types, at least for, uh, in, in the chip for, you know, depending on the properties of that network, right? If it's a completely dense network, if you happen to have a crossbar tech, uh, uh, encoding or the structure, well, then we have a, a completely dense encoding where you don't have, you know, you have the minimal number of pointers interspersed in this memory. You're just having a list of weights as you would have in a crossbar uh, structure. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a highly sparse network, you don't want to have to list tons of zeros, right? Which is what the crossbar architecture gives you. Uh, instead, you have a, a pointer and value sort of encoding so that you can, um, you know, efficiently represent the specific connection that you have in your network. And we have things in the middle, and then we also have what's quite novel. Uh, we have a hierarchical connectivity model here so that you can look at, if you have redundancy, a repeated weight pattern in your network, you can separately store that once and then just refer to that for populations of neurons. Uh, so the simplest form of this is the well-known convolutional network idea, where you have a kernel of weights that gets applied to patches across an image. Um, that, that's the simplest possible way to use such a feature like this, you know. But there's much more complicated ways you can, you can uh, um, 
extract that redundancy and, and uh, uh, compress it in low EE. Question? Yeah. Average connect to this? To ah, like uh, um, uh, randomly generate the connectivity. Yes. Um, no, no. That, we, we've thought about that. That yeah, that could be useful in some contexts. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, you you would still uh, uh, unless you randomly generate the weights, you're still going to have the weight uh, state for that. So there's a limit. Um, you know, and as certainly with learning, then you need to have you know very specific weights. So there's a limited use for that, but it could be useful. Yeah. Um, okay, so we also, most people think of synapses as being weights, right, almost synonymously, but really it's more complicated than that. And in particular, we support synaptic delays, which is a variable associated with the synapse. You know, if you recognize we're in a temporal computing architecture here where delay is computationally significant, uh, the, the, you, you want to be able to specifically add a delay per connection to get the best value of that. Uh, that, that capability. So uh, um, we have some algorithms that, that definitely use it. You heard something about polychronous uh, uh, networks, which uh, you know need that feature. Um, you know, there's a number of cases where this this potentially comes up. You know, if you think about coincidence detection, you need to kind of align all of the spikes to a particular you know uh, alignment that it's going to recognize. So you need synaptic delays for that, not axon delays, right? So previous. Uh, designs have had axon delays, but really this, we'd make a distinction here and say that there's something called a synaptic delay, and, and that's important. Um, we also have synaptic eligibility traces. So this is an idea that's been around for a long time, I think since, since the 60s in neuroscience. Um, uh, th this idea that you have a, some kind of state that uh, arises in the net operation of the network, and it's a, it's a fading memory of some kind of a provisional change that just fades away over time based on a later feedback, reward, or punishment, you then apply that eligibility state um, to, to implement the plasticity, the changes in the weights. So we have that. That's a, that's a variable associated with each uh, synapse. So generally speaking, we, have, we treat our synapses as a three-tuple, where we have a weight, a delay, and then a tag, which is you know, what you may use for a synaptic eligibility trace. Um, but really, the tag is just a scratch variable. And, and in fact, you can decouple the delay. Not everybody wants synaptic delays. So, so really what you have is a delay and a tag as two uh, variables, dynamic variables that are available to learning processes uh, so that you can create a complex dynamical system you know, in each synapse. And all of those are variable precision. So some networks don't need you know, a lot of precision per, per weight. Right? You can get by with just a single bit to say whether it's connected or not. In other cases, if you're doing learning, you know, gradient-based learning, you typically need some precision in those uh, weights. So, so to, again, to get the maximum flexibility, the maximum use of our fixed resource, uh, we, we allow those to be variable precision. So if you only have one bit weights, you can fill up that memory with just single bit connections and get you know, 130,000 synapses. If you need sign nine bit weights, well then you're going to get you know nine times less than than, than that. We also we also have a question. So when the, are the weights used for some kind of multiplication? Uh, it's not multiplication; it's just addition, right? So uh, we'll talk about the operation in a minute. Um, yeah, but it's uh, yeah. There's not because the input. Spike carries no information, right? All you're doing is reading the weight and then accumulating it to the amount of synaptic activation that's, that's arrived. Um, so then we have these, we do have these graded, uh, having just said that, we also have these things called graded reward spikes that do carry a graded you know, value with it. Uh, and that's specifically to support a reinforcement learning types of uh, algorithms where you want to convey some sense of how good or bad you know, the state that the whole system has reached. And so you can communicate that with like a, a, an 8-bit graded number embedded in the spike message. And then that's available to the learning processes. It's kind of a following a dopamine type of a you know, model of neuromodulation. Then we have you know, a bunch of learning features. So we'll talk about these. And I, I, I you know, did preview these on Wednesday, right, as far as what our learning architecture looks like. So we have these uh, microcode programmed learning rules, um, microcode being kind of a you know, big word for just you know building equations, basically specifying a mathematical equation of what learning rules are being applied at each synapse. Uh, this is dealing with uh, you know these things we call traces, so filtered spike trains, you know, with different time constants, different impulse values. Um, 
and uh, generally it's, it's adding this all up in kind of a sum of products form. Uh, and you can apply these rules to you know, any of these variables, you know, weight, delay, tag, you know, the, they're all the same as far as the learning engine is concerned. So you, know, you can just uh, uh, couple them, define them however you like. Okay, so that's just kind of a high level walkthrough of the feature set of the chip. Um, you know, we'll, uh, for those more design oriented and wondering what the, the words were, uh, not just the letters, maybe you can kind of read them now. Um, but, uh, but I'm not gonna really go into any more detail on this. This is just to just give you a glimpse of maybe what more specifically this looks like and the, the design. Um, you know, so, so really from an architecture perspective, this isn't relevant at all, but just, uh, you know, for your curiosity, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, we, we have to arbitrate a number of different operations here, you know, depending on whether you've got spikes arriving, you're servicing neurons, you have uh, management operations, learning operations, all of this. For deterministic, you know, simple operation, we have a single kind of point of arbitration, as we call it. Um, keeps it simple. We do have some internal parallelism in the design, which uh, you know is maybe not something you would think about. You know, you think mainly about the parallelism in the mesh itself, but to balance the bandwidths uh, that that a, a neuromorphic design needs to uh, support, it's not simply a single unified pathway. You know, is not the most efficient solution. So, so we have to think a little bit about where do we need additional parallelism in the core um, to kind of optimize the performance of the overall system. So we have that in, in the synaptic handling pathway as well as in the learning uh, pathway. Uh, the, the microcode here is stored in a tiny little memory and uh, there's a, a kind of an elaborate scheme that we're not gonna go really into but to associate what learning rules apply to every synapse. Because obviously if you think about it, you know, you're, you're not gonna specify an equation per synapse. That's way too much state, right? You'd have more state associated with your programming of your learning rules than the weights themselves, right? So instead we have to have an indirection mechanism where you can associate the learning rules either on the input axon or the postsynaptic neuron or the class of synapse that uh, the, the synapse belongs to. Any of those sources can kind of ultimately derive a pointer, you can think, or a profile as we call it. Um, and then that looks up into this memory, the particular microcode kind of equations to then apply uh, to, to those synapse, uh, synaptic variables. Uh, yeah, I think I already mentioned that you know, all, all our management operations are sent in band, so we're reusing the same you know, multiplexed network on chip fabric. Uh, for efficiency. We actually have two physical fabrics, actually, so uh, that's for deadlock avoidance reasons. If you know anything about, you know, kind of system on chip design, you need virtual channels. Uh, we just have two physical channels. That's minimally what we need to avoid deadlock. Um, yeah, that's for, for spike communication, there's actually no ordering constraints whatsoever. So although we need these two physical fabrics, we can balance our spike traffic across the two of them, so it ends up being, you know, very efficient uh, way, to, way to do things. Um, Generally, you know, again, in this spirit of overloading our SRAMs, you know, we have a lot of different uh, configuration uh, modes. So we don't, you know, if you see a register spec of the chip, it's gonna be really confusing because depending on various configuration settings, other SRAMs get interpreted in other ways. So uh, we generally don't give you register visibility to the chip because it's just, it's too, too confusing and complicated to think about. We expose, you know, abstract that through the software layer. Um, and, and then deep under the hood, uh, you know, although these are architectural SRAMs I'm showing here, um, you know, really, you know, you can see there's all these read modify loops, right? This is a pretty fundamental characteristic of, of these uh, spike neural network systems is that we have tight dynamic modifications happening of all these parameters and all this state. And this is very different from conventional microarchitecture of, of just, you know, traditional CPUs or other ASICs. Um, and it's a bit of a challenge to manage all that. So what we have is a kind of a pseudo multi-ported memory kind of, uh, 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 pattern, design pattern, you could call it, uh, that, that we're reusing all the way through here. So there's some kind of pseudo-random uh, bank striping that's going on to achieve good, good efficiency. So it's a little, little complicated, you know, plus there's a bunch of serial processes, you know, depending on, you know, if you think about exponential decay filtering, you know, these are, these are not trivial to com uh, compute uh, with digital logic. And, uh, you know, there's various tricks that uh, can make this efficient, but some of it involves serialization. So, 
generally speaking, you, you, there's a huge amount of variability in how much time different functions may take. You know, due to uh, multi-porting in the memories, due to exponential decays, and other processes that may be serialized uh, from time to time. So for all that reason, for maybe not the reason you expect, but it's a really good match for asynchronous design, having this embedded handshaking happening in the design because it can completely transparently accommodate this big diversity of frequencies and, and, uh, and performance cycles that you have in the design. So anyway, that's, that's as much as I'll say about the design because that's really not the, not the point of this uh, tutorial, but some of you may find that interesting. Uh, this is back to functionality, so to make it crystal clear you know, what these cores are doing when they're servicing spikes and how they're generating spikes. Uh, never mind about learning for now. Uh, so this is operation of the core. You know, we've said it's multiplexed, so this is like unrolled you know, in time you know, vertically across the, the screen here uh, to, to illustrate as if it was implemented just as a discrete circuit. Uh, it makes it a little clearer that way. So, so now you have these spikes that arrive. You know, they arrive effectively on one of these virtual channels, which is identified by an axon ID, multiplex, but you know, unrolled. It looks like a physical wire here. Um, and so that ID goes through a complicated routing function, which we can just encapsulate as just this black, this white box. And uh, and then that you know just expands into a variety of weight delay pairs. So. This is what's happening with those weights, back to the question earlier. It, they're getting scheduled to be serviced at some future point in time based on that delay value. The current time is t. And so this is the kind of the set of you know, the buckets of accumulated synaptic activity that has arrived in the past. Um, that, and, and so this, this output process is, is servicing the, the accumulated uh, synaptic weight you know, sum illustrated here for the current time t. All the other spikes that are coming in are adding weight to future time buckets, t plus 1 up to t to whatever. So this is circular FIFO here, uh, circular buffer. Um, and, and these values are stable on time t. They're not modifying. So that gives us you know, determinism. And uh, so then we have this dendrite, dendrite process here, which is um, you know, kind of generalizing from a neuron. You know, this is our multi-compartment dendrite structure here. But you can think of these as just basically neurons. And so this structure is, is walking through all the active neurons and servicing, you know, the, the updating their state, their dynamic state. And so it's reading the accumulated weights, it's reading configuration, and then reading the current state values, applying some neuron evolution model, you know, the Kuba model, and then uh, updating the state. And if it's sufficiently activated, then it generates a spike and it you know, sends that out to the NOC. So simple as that. That's, that's basically inference in the chip. So yep. How is fault tolerance, uh, is, is, is fault tolerance integrated into this somehow? Uh, well, not, not explicitly. So we have not explained. The question is whether fault tolerance is incorporated into this. Uh, so uh, you know, we do it in a, a very conventional way in some sense. So our SRAMs are ECC protection, right? Like that's not very neural, you know, <laughs> redundant, right? But, uh, but again, just to have chips come back from fab and operate as we want them to, uh, ECC is what you need. Um, now, if you know, for the, the pursuing this kind of this potential feature of resiliency to you know other faults and problems that may arise in manufacturing or soft errors and that sort of stuff, um, uh, that, that's more an unexplored regime, right? You, in theory, yes, you can provide some resiliency to all that class of, of defects and, and, and errors, but, uh, but that would be more in, you know, you could explore that from an algorithmic programming perspective, um, and, and we haven't really prioritized that direction much. But, but clearly, the architecture offers that uh, long-term advantage. So, I mean, in, in the sense that we can not use any core. Every chip that we've manufactured just about uh, is useful in some way because we can have SRAM defects, of course, and at worst, we can just say, okay, we're not going to use that core. And then we push into software to not map you know, uh, neurons into those cores. So there, there's a variety of ways that the, the nice homogeneous nature of the architecture can provide some, some uh, nice properties. Uh, so are there any resources for the dendrite to uh, <clears throat> configure its uh, uh, yes. Well, that's embedded in the configuration, you know, of that. Uh, so, and, and I'll, I'll briefly talk about a little bit of the dendrite uh, configuration. But uh, 
Uh, let me blow through this since uh, you know, we're, we should probably pick up the pace. So um, I, I covered this on Wednesday, but uh, you know, hopefully this was all clear to everybody, you know, what the basic constraint here, this uh, notion of, of local learning, and, and then how that maps into the entire architecture, the fact that we have learning embedded you know, in every core. We don't have a separate sideband processor that's like having to become the sequential bottleneck in updating you know, all, the, all the neural parameters. This is embedded. It only has access to the local state here, you know, uh, in addition to, you know, these, these reward spikes that I mentioned, which are conveying kind of more global, but, you know, not, not completely global. The, the reward spikes have a certain distribution. We have four of these axons per core. Um, and so you, you have, you know, access to four different modulatory channels, you can think of it, you know, in these learning rules. And then here's this slide I showed earlier about the, the, this kind of trace-based uh, programmable model um, where, uh, you know, again, hopefully it was, it was clear when I went through it on Wednesday, but, you know, just to briefly recap, you know, you have these spikes arriving on the input, you know, you have spikes getting generated at the output neuron, that's the red and the blue traces. You can configure the filtering to either be in a very, you know, short time constant correlation regime, which then is what we think of as SDDP. Um, or you can be in this, you know, very long time averaged regime where now you're, you can think of these values, these traces as correspond to long term, you know, rates of firing. And then you build out your equations, you know, in this manner. And I think you'll see a bit more detail later on that. So uh, you'll, you'll see some um, concrete examples of how you program this into the chip. Um, but, uh, but, you know, you basically, these Vs are, are all of those variables that we talked about, you know, the, the uh, weight, the delay, the tag, the input traces, the red traces, the output blue traces, the reward traces, you know, all of these are accessible um, in these uh, equations you can build out. And then you otherwise have constants that you can add or scale. Uh, yep. So are these the same sum of product equations that are in the microcode? Or are yeah, yeah. When, when I was talking about microcode earlier, that's exactly what, it's just building out these equations, yeah. Okay, so that's, that's that. Um, Here's some actual examples. So, uh, you know, this, if you're coming from a computational neuroscience perspective, these may just make complete sense and is a, you know, this is duh. Uh, if you're not, then these may be a little mysterious, but, but basically expressed in equation form, you know, if you know about pairwise STDP, B and PU, you know, that's how you express it. Um, so, you know, here, you know, for example, we have the depressive term, which is, you know, our, our convention is that the subscripts indicate the kind of the time scale of filtering. So a bigger subscript means a longer time scale of filtering. And a zero subscript means there's no filtering. So it's just the direct impulse. It'll be one when the spike arrives, zero otherwise. So, so in that case, you know, if you think about this STDP rule, you know, X zero means, okay, when the spike arrives, X zero is one, and it's sampling the postsynaptic trace, Y one, which is a filtered version. So if the Y1 trace is positive, non-zero, that means the spike has arrived shortly after the postsynaptic neuron spiked, right? And so that's the you know, uh, depressive term, the anti-causal. You know, that, that, that spike could not have contributed to the neuron firing. Therefore, it's useless. Let's get rid of it. And so it, it, it decreases the weight. That's minus term. And then on the other hand, you have the symmetric case of the, the postsynaptic neuron spiking sampling the input trace. And, and that would be a potentiating term because that means that the spike arrived shortly before the neuron spiked. So that's, that's simple SDDP, but then you can quickly go to more complicated rules. So you may have heard of triplet SDDP that actually adds a longer term averaging, you know, rate of this postsynaptic uh, neuron, Y2. Um, otherwise, it's, it's actually similar to the SDDP. It's exactly the same as SDDP. Uh, and then in this case, it's also got a heterosynaptic decay to keep weights from kind of runawaying and saturating, which tends to be a, a, a characteristic of STDP-based networks. Uh, so here now we have a penalized term of yet a longer term rate measure. So the more active a, a particular neuron is, it's going to tend to decay all the weights associated with that and kind of this slow exponential decay, and that just kind of keeps the weights from, from saturating. Uh, so this is just an example of a more complex learning rule that, you know, people study and model in, you know, kind of computational neuroscience and, and find it uh, to be useful and corresponding actually to actual, you know, neuroscience processes in neurons. Um, but, you know, you can also do other things. You can apply to delays. So here's, here's a, a delay-based learning rule, which will tend to kind of try to uh, enforce coincidence detection in some cases. And uh, you can have these multivariate, uh, you know, more complicated um, synaptic systems here where you have the tag uh, rule. So here's the distal reward 
um, you know, reinforcement learning case. So the T is the tag, and this is basically uh, capturing an eligibility trace. So this is the STDP pairwise term. Um, so it's provisionally capturing that STDP change that it might apply to the weight. It decays that away over time. So there's just an exponential decay term on that tag. And you know that that variable is just not having any impact on inference, you know, on, on general operation uh, until you get this reward input, which is the R1 trace. If that goes positive, now it's going to go and take whatever is you know state is 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 left in that uh, eligibility trace and apply it to the weight. So that that's one example of how you could use this to do a reinforcement learning type of rule. This comes from Izakevich, I think, 2006 or so. He has a paper where he kind of quantified this whole framework. Uh, then, uh, then we have, uh, yeah, this is just to kind of illustrate maybe the, uh, an extreme of complexity where, um, you know, this has not actually, we haven't actually used this for any algorithmic purpose yet. This is more speculative based on some of, you know, these kind of ideas people are exploring. But this is using the tag as more of an inertial term to the weight. And it may be helpful for, say, catastrophic forgetting to have kind of a longer term, slower moving weight value. But in the short term, you can kind of buff it around uh, the weight based on, you know, short term statistics. So just speculative, just to show the, the range. OK, then a little bit about this hierarchical connectivity uh, feature I mentioned, just so that it, it hopefully becomes a little clear if it's not. Um, so this is generalizing this idea of convolution uh, from convolutional neural networks in deep learning. Uh, you know, and you can think of this in, a, in an image sense. You know, it's that you have a patch. And then the patch is like walking through the image you know, in some overlapped way. You're applying the same set of weights on every single patch. So you definitely don't want to store all those redundant weights in a flat way. Of course, nature does, right? Nature, or V1, it's all these like repetitive uh, receptive fields uh, because, well, you know, that, that's what nature has to do, right? We, again, are in a different regi design regime. We have the option of using multiplexing and uh, designing in a little bit more cleverness here. And so that's where this feature comes in, where we, we store the weights associated with that patch just once. And, and here is just kind of an illustration of in a one-dimensional sense, that's kind of what it looks like. You know, you have features associated with each patch process, uh, processing. So how active is that particular, you know, kernel? And, uh, and then you have connectivity arcs, you know, from, from different uh, positions of this patch, the different orientations of the segments of, of, of the components of the, 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 the patch. Um, and so that gives you just like a, a simple connectivity. You maybe have one inputs from one side, input from the other side to this patch. Um, and, and this would be just simple convolution. Now what we can do for, say, that LCA example that I showed, we, we have more than just linear feed forward weights, right? We have lateral inhibition. And so that complicates this you know, away from the simple convolutional structure, where now we have these lateral connections that from this, these, these feature uh, neurons, we have connections to other feature neurons. You know? And so in a one-dimensional sense, you'll have ones to your left and then ones to your right. Um, and, but, but in general, you know, we haven't done anything specific to convolution in Loihi. What we really have is just a template-based connectivity mechanism. So you know, if you think about it in this very generic way, you just have a set of population types of neurons, and you're defining connectivity between these population types. So this is just you know, using all the compression mechanisms that are available to you. You define in some way how these neurons in this population connect to these neurons in that population. And then you just store that once in the synaptic memory. And then as spikes arrive dynamically during operation, this connectivity is applied down to the specific population instances that you know, the, the, the spikes course on to. So this is a way to just compress out redundancy in your network of whatever kind. Uh, a simple other case beyond convolution would be, say, a winner-take-all network, where you have a simple, you know, stereotypical lateral connection across all these uh, winner-take-all neurons, and you don't want to represent that for every winner-take-all group. So this, this is a pretty powerful technique if you have uh, econ uh, redundancy in the network. OK, and then on multi-compartment neurons, um, this uh, may be a little bit elaborate to go through at this point in detail. But, but basically, you know, if you recognize that what we're doing in the core here is we're walking through sequentially you know, the active neuron states, we can think of, OK, well, maybe these aren't necessarily neurons. What if we just call these compartments, right? And we just want to create a tree of these compartments. All we need to do is preserve a tiny bit of state uh, associated with the, the dynamical you know, uh, state variables of, of each of those compartments. And then we can just propagate these forward 
you know, by some amount. Um, and then we can aggregate. We just join that state together as we, as we propagate sequentially through these, these uh, compartments. And so the state that needs to be recorded here or, or stored temporarily, it just corresponds to the cross-sectional kind of width of that tree. So it's, it's, it's not that much. I mean, if you want to do an incredibly complicated neuron, well, OK, it, you know, very broad uh, neuron as opposed to a deep neuron, uh, it, it gets uh, expensive. But uh, if you just want some simple aggregation of neurons, certainly if you just want to add serially in a chain to create a bunch of different types of uh, synaptic responses, incredibly cheap and easy. And you can, you can build some interesting tree structures this way. Um, and then you know, we, we then slightly modify the Kuba neuron model to support you know, the, the joining of this dynamic state to, at, the, at the join points in this dendritic tree. Uh, you know, here is the Kuba neuron model expressed in a signal processing manner. If you're computational neuroscience, this may look strange to you. If you're electrical engineer, this looks like, wow, you didn't know a neuron model was so simple. It's just two, two first order filters, basically, with a, uh, with a nonlinear thresholding function. Uh, but that is what the Kuba, that's what, what a spike neuron is. Uh, it's just a filter. Um, and so what we do is we just augment that slightly to say, OK, well, you have dynamic state that's coming from you know, other place in this uh, tree, you know, from, from the other branch. And, and then we join that with a couple possible operations. You know, we either join the U, the current state variable, or we can join kind of with some Boolean operations the spiking condition. So you can have one neuron, say, gate the spiking in another based on how it, you know, where it's at in its threshold. Uh, so that's, that's our multi-compartment model. So you see we just had to make a small modification, and now we get potentially a big expansion of functionality. So it's up to you to think about how to use that. Um, as I say, the, here are some of the operations that we support. You know, the add is the one that for sure comes up a lot. So that's the reason we did the whole thing. Uh, and then we kind of speculatively put in some of these other features. So um, the SLAM example you briefly saw uh, from uh, uh, Konstantinos uh, McMizos, they've actually found some creative ways to use some of the other uh, features here to, to implement their SLAM model. Uh, so it's nice to see that, that it's th these others have received some use. Uh, I won't go through all this detail, but this is basically how it gets implemented. You know, we use a stack basically to, to keep track of the uh, uh, state, and then that just simple stack operations can can provide you know support for building out these kind of trees of dendrites, and you get complicated neuron structures. Okay, so that's multi-compartment. We have homeostasis, which. Uh, uh, I, I won't go through in detail, but, but basically, you know, the homeostasis feature corresponds to watermarks of activity. So again, we have a trace, a filtered activity trace of the neuron spiking, and that gives us a measure of long-term kind of activity. And if the activity is too low, below the low watermark, this A min value, uh, you see, A min, uh, then it'll drop the threshold. And if it's above the high watermark, then it'll um, raise the threshold. So it will try to target a certain kind of um, range of activity that you, you know, want the neuron to operate in. Um, so that, that comes up. There's other ways to do homeostasis, actually. It's just a plot showing behavior over time, but it's pretty intuitive. Um, then, uh, let's see, other synaptic features is it gets to kind of some minor features, but they're good to keep in mind that they exist. Um, so something we call box synapses. So, so this is showing the postsynaptic current response that, by default, everyone thinks about, uh, and that's, you know, after some delay, after a spike arrives, you know, you have a weight activation, that's the impulse, and that decays away over time. So that's getting integrated onto the current, the, the voltage of the neuron. Um, well, in some cases, in some theoretical frameworks, and just a variety of surprising different places it comes up, you want something a little simpler, actually, but uh, uh, what we call a box synapse, where now the, the weight is still the, the height of this thing, but the delay then corresponds to the, the duration of just this fixed application of a, of a weight. Um, and so, for example, that comes up in, in this constraint satisfaction, you know, stochastic neuron framework uh, that uh, Wolfgang Moss and team have, have explored. And it just turns out that the math is nice and tractable if you have, you know, this box type of a synaptic response corresponding to kind of a box refractory uh, period response. And so um, in this case, you know, it's just mathematically the whole system is cleaner and more well-defined if you have this type of a synaptic response. But this has also come up in a variety of other cases uh, too. So it's just good to be aware that that feature is available. We also have something we call weight scaling. So um, particularly, you know, you, if you think about it, that we have these variable width weights and you want to really compress out the, the, the uh, 
the storage and your, and your weights. You may have a mixture of single bit weights and eight bit weights. And in order for these to all ultimately live on the same weight scale, you need to scale these separately. So we have that feature so that you know, if, if you, say, have a learning process which treats uh, plastic synapses as 8-bit values, but after some period of time, they saturate either to 0 or to full 128 and, and, or 255, um, and, and then you want to remove the plasticity, well, you can compress that away and replace it with a single-bit weight. But then you need to apply some scale factor so that th those class of weights are then scaled back up to 255, right? So that they can still coexist in the network. So that's, that's for example, why we have this particular feature. Um, and then also we have a nonlinearity in this function too, a weight limit that can be applied. And you may be familiar with um, some, some people talk about permanence of weight values, where, where you may actually want your, your learning dynamic variable to exceed some maximum strength but just to record a, strong, a more strongly connected, more permanent synaptic connection. And so that's what this weight limit can provide. You can have the, the, the learning variable exceed some max value, and that just you know, allows it to become more strongly connected uh, uh, for, the, for the learning process. Um, okay, then just a reminder about the barrier sync process. Um, you know, this uh, went through it on Wednesday, and it's pretty intuitive, so I won't go over it again. But the, the key is to, you know, recognize that we have this, this synchronization that's emerging asynchronously in the system on every time step. And uh, that, you know, you may think about, uh, uh, see this as being a, a potential performance weak point of this whole system, because it's all got to synchronize, right? And we're not using a clock. We don't distribute this with a wire. We're distributing this through in-band messaging in our NOC. And uh, you know, the question is, how high performance is this? Uh, so I won't go through all of this. I assume you remember. Um, but uh, this, I can share with you uh, results we have from our 32-chip uh, Nahuku system, uh, which, which shows I, I blew through this on Wednesday. I'll just describe a little more detail, just so that you know you have a quantitative feel for for what you know the, this this architecture provides in terms of performance. So this is this graph search example of propagating spike wavefronts through the system to find the shortest path. Uh, so it, it we, we've benchmarked this barrier synchronization process on the 32 chip system with this um, 3D lattice graph structure. So it's a very simple uh, network structure. Um, you know, you can have binary connections in here. When you when you map that to a planar, you know, Nahuku system, the mesh, um, the the traffic patterns get to be very, you know, kind of messy and complex. It's, it's not a simple wavefront. It's all kinds of uh, uh, activity that uh, has to propagate through the network. So it's it's not not I wouldn't say it's a torture test, but it's definitely you know not a trivial uh, example. Um, and so. If you look at this 50 by 50 by 50 network, this 125,000 neurons, we can map that on one chip. And if we map that on one chip and then we solve it, um, we find that we get this breakdown in performance where the barrier synchronization, the blue bar, is taking about a microsecond uh, to, to synchronize on every time step. And then we have our sequential functions, which is the neuron updates, so updating all the dynamical state. And we also have learning that's occurring. That's how it's actually remembering, basically, what the shortest path is, is by changing the weight connections as the, as the wavefront propagates. And so that's also a sequential function that's happening in every core. So that's a big you know, contri contributor to uh, you know, performance, uh, you know, or to, to the time the, to perform the computation. And then we have all the, 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 blue, the green here is the time to, uh, the extra time required. Some of these are concurrent, but this is basically the extra time required in the network to distribute and handle all the spike traffic. So this is what you get on a single chip mapping this, this, uh, this problem. Now what we can do is we can um, distribute the same number of cores across all 32 chips. So we have the same amount of sequential computation because we haven't increased really the parallelism. We've just spread the cores out across all these 32 chips. And now you can see that the, the time to execute each time step slows down here because, well, we have larger, longer distances for the spike traffic to follow. And so you can see, well, and importantly, the barrier synchronization process has to span all these 32 chips. So this is showing quantitatively how this slows down at this point. So the barrier sync takes you know, more time. 
uh, and in fact, uh, we've, we've optimized this. The barrier sync is not a simple process, and there's various tricks to it. So this is actually down to about four microseconds now. Uh, but, but in any case, it's something, you know, you can see it increases. Otherwise, these sequential elements don't change at all. The spike traffic increases a little bit, but not really perceptibly. Now what you can do is you can start spreading the network out and using the extra cores parallelism that's available across this, all of these 32 chips. So you can, you can increase the number of cores from 128 to 256. You know, then you can go to 1024. You can go more and more and more to use the parallel. And now you have fewer neurons per core, so the sequential process in every core is less. And so you can see that the, the sequential components of the computation, the, the learning and the neuron updates, are, are squeezing down you know, and taking less time. You're getting a benefit from that extra parallelization. But at some point, the, the, uh, the spike traffic actually takes more time because the chip-to-chip -chip links are, are slower than the on-chip links. So by spreading out and using more cores, you're, you're engaging more, you're generating more spike traffic, basically. And so at some point, that, that uh, starts increasing. So there's a sweet spot, and it corresponds to about uh, nine chips, I think, in this case. But, uh, but in any case, that, that's, um, you know, as I, as I say, this is actually today, this is somewhat old data, so this would all drop down. You know, we, we can run this network across 32 chips, and it's under 10 microseconds a time step, right? So, you know, comfortably 100 times faster than, than real time, you know, notionally real time. Okay, so that's it on the architecture, and uh, I think we, we're going to take a, a, a quick break now, but I suspect we're uh, a bit over time. Uh, yep? Just a quick question um, about the neurons. Have some uh, stochasticity. Where is it? Is it accessible from? Is it accessible from on the, like in a synapse, uh, for instance, in your hand? Or no, it's it's um, for the most part. It's uh, you, biggest use we found for it is to add it additively on the membrane potential. Okay. You can also add it to the refractory delay, uh, or the input current. You know, as you've accumulated synaptic input. But for the most part, uh, you know, adding it to the membrane potential is the most useful. OK, um, so maybe we'll take a, just a, yeah, maybe shorter than that, five minute, quick bio break, basically. And then uh, and if you have any specific questions on the architecture, um, I can answer them now. And then otherwise, we'll, we'll move on to the next.